Well, welcome back to this series we're calling The Journey, and we're learning a lot about the Apostle Paul, and in learning about his life, we're also gaining life lessons uh, for our lives. And so we're on life lesson number four, and that is don't listen to the crowd. Now, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and take out your message notes and uh, take some notes today. If you're online, you can download those, but uh, just right up front, I wanna make sure you hear Uh, this statement, okay? If you follow Jesus, you can't listen to the crowd. You can't listen to Jesus and follow him while at the same time listening to the crowd. So if you are here today and you say, you know what, I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna trust Jesus. I wanna obey Jesus. I love Jesus. If you are following Jesus, you can't listen to the crowd. And... If you love Jesus, you're gonna love the people in that crowd. Now I want you to see how this unpacks in Matthew chapter nine, verse 36, and your notes are on the screen. Look at this, it says, when Jesus looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. I want you to know that when I look over the crowds in our culture today, I look at what's happening in our world, I look at the lies that people are believing, the direction people are going away from God, Truly, the the scriptures predicted there would be a day where right would be called wrong and wrong would be called right. When I see the crowds today, my heart breaks for the crowds. And look at the description of the crowds. It says, Jesus looked out over the crowds. They were so confused and aimless like sheep with no shepherd. So circle confused and circle aimless. I think if there were ever two words that describe the world today, there they are. Uh, the Greek word confused is the Greek word ekloo, and it literally means to grow weak, to grow tired, to be exhausted, to be overwhelmed. Does that sound like our culture? For sure, everybody's tired, everybody's exhausted, everybody's uh, weary, everybody's overwhelmed. Uh, as a matter of fact, this word in the Greek is a specific kind of exhaustion. It doesn't just mean, hey, I'm tired. It means exhaustion caused by lack of food. It's interesting because the crowd, as he looked out spiritually, they were exhausted because they weren't feeding on the word of God. And if you listen to the crowd, you're gonna be tired at the end of every day. (laughs) If you listen to the crowd, you're gonna be weary and overwhelmed at the end of every day. So your choices are listen to the crowd or listen to Christ. Listen to what the world is telling you or listen to what the word is telling you. And so we we see at the get-go here that, that the crowd is some, some, a group of people we need to have a heart for but we don't need to listen to. So let me see if I can summarize uh, so far. If you listen to the crowd instead of Christ, you will be confused. If you listen to Christ instead of the crowd, you will have a heart for the crowd because they're confused. I'm gonna say that one more time. If you listen to the crowd instead of Christ, you're gonna be confused. But if you listen to Christ, Instead of the crowd, your heart's gonna break for the crowd because they're confused. And we're gonna see how Paul, uh, who used to be, by the way, aimless and confused, that word aimless, that Greek word literally means to have no purpose, no meaning, uh, no direction in your life. Paul met purpose when Paul met Jesus. We just sang about Jesus. When you meet Jesus, you meet your purpose. And Jesus turned this murderer into a missionary and now he's on some journeys. He's on a journey called life. Now, I've shown this map, let me show it again. Paul went on four missionary journeys. Very impressive in any time, any day, even if it was today. But let me remind you, there were no bicycles, there were no skateboards. There was no internet, he couldn't you know, get on Facebook. Hey, DM me if you're gonna be in Corinth, I'll be there too, okay? He was just on his own. And he's walking, and he walked over 10,000 miles to share the gospel. That's like walking from New York to LA four times. Now today, we're gonna look at the first missionary journey. So we'll single it out, and you'll see where he went. He left the church in Antioch. So I'm gonna ask you to turn your Bibles to Acts 14. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. Gave out one to an adult who never had a Bible after the first service today. So turn your Bibles to Acts 14. Now Acts 13, this journey begins and the church in Antioch sends him out. You'll notice he hops over to the island of Cyprus and he goes up to the north into modern day Turkey. And in Acts 13, he goes to three cities. In Acts 14, it starts with Iconium. You'll see Iconium there. And today's text, he's walking into, you'll see Lystra. Now notice this is part of this region called Galatia. 
Now, Paul, after he started churches in all these cities, he would write back to them, does anybody wanna guess the name of the book in your Bible that is written back to the people of Galatia? Galatians, biblical scholars have realized. That's right, Galatians, all right? Now, the people of Galatia, that's where you've, you've heard of the Gauls, uh, very uh, you know, intimidating people. This is called the region of Anatolia. Now, uh, speaking of Anatolia, let me show you the favorite dog, my favorite dog I ever owned, okay? Here's his picture. He's the one on the right. That's my dog, okay? The one on the left is my daughter's dog, uh, a Maltese. Now, the Maltese thought that she was that big. She was little dog, big dog syndrome, but she wasn't that big, okay? Now, the one on the right is an Anatolian shepherd. If you're gonna get a dog, get a dog, Okay? <laughs> I mean, get a dog. And this Anatolian, I'm telling you, nobody came on the porch. Nobody came in the yard because this dog is rough, huge, and mean. You say, what does that have to do with Paul? Glad you asked. The people of Galatia were from Anatolia. This is an Anatolian shepherd from that region. And these dogs are mean, they're big, and they're rough. So were the people. As a matter of fact, a soldier in the Roman army also an historian wrote this, let me show you this quote about the people of Galatia. He said they were of lofty stature. They even intimidated the Roman army, which was invincible in their minds, but they could never conquer this area completely. But it says, terrible from the sternness of their eyes, very quarrelsome and of great pride and insolence, end quote. Doesn't that just sound like a group of people you wanna get to know? Let's go reach them for Jesus. You know, surely Paul, like Paul, can we save the Galatians till the end and start somewhere else? Remember, Paul wasn't intimidated, and he's like, you know where I'm going? I'm going straight to these Gentiles in Galatia, modern-day Turkey. Now, um, we're gonna see how Paul encounters the crowd, but I wanna do something different today. I'm actually gonna give you the application first because of the way the text lays out. So I'm gonna give you two applications of the text, and then we'll see how Paul interacts with the crowd. And so here's how the story begins where we find our first application. Let's go down to verse eight of chapter 14. In verse eight, it says, while they were at Lystra, so we have already know where that is, uh, Paul and Barnabas, oh, there's Barnabas, remember his friend, man, they're friends, they're on an adventure, they do life together now, uh, came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth. So he had never walked, and he was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Here's the first application, write this down. See the one among the many. You see, there's a lot of people in Lystra, there's a crowd in Lystra, but Paul sees one person in the crowd among all that many, and we see here from birth could not walk, had a lot of challenges, was hurting, had a really hard story, but was listening to what Paul was sharing, was listening to the gospel. You see, what Paul is teaching us here about the crowd is, listen, stop worrying about what the crowd is saying and look to the one in that crowd who is stuck with the crowd but wants to move but can't. Find the one among the many. In other words, stop saying or worrying about, oh man, we, we got this, this group of people or that group of people or this. Don't put all, everybody just in a box. In other words, stop saying, we need to do something about the homeless situation. There's just homeless people everywhere. What is happening? Do you know one? Have you ever met one? you ever talked to somebody who lives under a bridge? Have you been to our partner, Sunshine Center, where many uh, real life are there all the time and and just interact it and see how you can help, just one. Uh, down in Corpus, Purple Door, or uh, Good Samaritan. I mean, just being there, interacting, do you know one? You see, we gotta stop saying, oh man, we need to do something about Africa. There's so much poverty, there's so many people, we have to share the gospel. Do you know anybody in Africa? And listen, you could go on the Ghana mission trip this summer and you'll know more than one. Many of you uh, sponsor kids through one community, our partner, and you've got one child that you help and so you know one. You see, instead of putting everybody in a box and saying that crowd or this group of people or they, it's like, do you see the one? Uh, let me ask you by a show of hands online right here in the room. How many of you guys have at least one kid at home? I don't know what the age is, but you have at least one kid at home. Raise your hand. Okay, let's, that's the one. That's the one that God's entrusting to you. See the one. Uh, I would encourage all of us, let's start with our youth and our kids. Let's start with the kids and the youth because it not it easy to say, what are we gonna do with all these young people today? Teenagers are so rebellious. They don't listen. Have you ever listened to them? 
Do you know one? Have you ever heard their story? You see, it's so easy to lump them all together. All these teenagers are always on TikTok and Snapchat, and that's the devil. <laughs> Do you know one? You ever talk to one? I, I want to encourage you. Uh, listen, uh, Instagram is not the devil. As a matter of fact, on Instagram, uh, uh, I want to show you what a 17-year-old from our student ministry named Ryan posted on Instagram uh, applying what he was taught here at our church about, in youth ministry about how to study the Bible. So this may seem like a commercial break, but it applies to this first point of application. Here's Ryan on the World Wide Web talking about seeking God first. Watch this. Okay, so today we're gonna use the SOAP method to go through Matthew chapter six, verse 31 through 33. And the, the verse reads, don't worry and say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? The people who don't know God keep trying to get these things, and your Father in heaven knows you need them. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. So when we're observing the scripture, we can see where it says, the people who don't know God keep trying to get these things, and your Father in heaven knows you need them. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. So while we're observing the scripture, it's telling us how we can apply it, and we can apply it by it says here, seek, seek first God's kingdom and what God wants, then your other needs will be met as well. So now that we've gone through scripture, observation and application, um, I wanna encourage you guys to pray on how you can apply this verse in your life today and how you can seek God first. Come on. It's awesome. You see, if you meet Ryan, all of a sudden you're like, man, we're gonna do all these teenagers are so rebellious. Man, you meet Ryan, you're like, teenagers are awesome. I love 17 year olds. And all of a sudden, man, Ryan did a great job. Now, you may be tempted to think, oh yeah, well that's because, you know, Ryan, he comes from a third generation line of preachers. I'm sure his great, great grandfather, you know, was preaching, you know, and that's why he's, now listen, uh, Ryan has been a Christian less than nine months. Back this summer, he walked into this building and somebody saw him. You know who saw him? Pastor Ken. Now, Pastor Ken is not a teenager. <laughs> now, he has the energy of a teenager, but I love our staff and we have a heart for this and we, we want to see our staff have a heart for this, the heart of Jesus. Ken saw that kid and said, I don't know anything, but he sat down with Ryan and listened to Ryan's story. And then Ken shared Christ. And Ryan accepted Christ nine months ago and he's already preaching on Instagram. You see all of us, yeah, you see one, right, among the many, yeah. Now, here's the second application, go down to verse nine. It says, looking straight at him, so he sees him. He doesn't look at the crowd and call out the crowd, he sees the one in the crowd and Paul realized, you know what, he's got faith to be healed. So Paul called to him, to this one person in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Here's a huge takeaway, write this down. Help the one among the many. Don't just see them, look straight at them, but help them. Don't just see the one among the many, but how can I help? Now listen, it's hard to know how you can help until you see them and learn how they need help. In other words, this man's feet didn't work, which means he was sitting there while everybody else was sitting there, so how do you know? You see, when you look at a room like this, you're like, well, man, who's hurting in this room? Let me just tell you and encourage you. Everybody listen to me right now, here in this room and online, is hurting in some way has been through something, is going through something, the only way you're gonna know that is to see the one and see how you can help. But watch this. Too many Christians, we call out the weakness in the one. It says Paul looked straight at him. Did you catch that? Not at his feet. Paul didn't look at the crowd and go, hey, what's wrong with your feet, man? How come you can't walk? Look at me, I can walk. What's wrong with you? No, no, he sees a human being that needs hope and he says, listen, I don't wanna point out your weakness, but I am gonna tell you, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, your life is about to change. You're about to experience something you've never experienced before and you're about to have a life you've never ever imagined. Now, can we just get real at real life today? You guys ready to get real? Okay, four people, awesome, okay. <laughs> Isn't it easy for us as Christians to walk through life and just put people in boxes? But what they wear, maybe what they say on Instagram, who their followers are, whatever it might be, oh, you're in that crowd. Oh, you're in that group. And we see people and we say, they. They are that people, they're that crowd, and if we're not careful as Christians, 
we think in our minds, I can't reach them. Now, we know God loves them. We wouldn't say God doesn't love them. We would just say we can't help them. But listen, friends, there's people in that group, that crowd that you're walking by, they are stuck. They can't move. They can't get to you like this guy. He can't move. You've got to see them. You've got to go to them. You've got to help them. But we look at them, whoever them happens to be, and as Christians, we decide they are unreachable, untouchable, and impossible to reach. Now, I don't have time to go through all of that list that I've heard Christians say them about. Let me just give you an example. Let's talk about gentlemen's clubs. It got really quiet. When my son was nine years old, he was in that phase where he would sit in the back of the car and he would read every sign on every building. (laughs) And one day we were downtown and from the back of the car I heard, Dad, what's a gentleman's club? And all of a sudden, you know, you get that shout from the back. You're not prepared for this as a parent, but you gotta answer. There's a question. And I told him, I said, well, first of all, son, real gentlemen don't go in there. But then I told him what happened in a gentleman's club. And I can still remember, he got really quiet in the back seat. And there was a big pause and a lot of silence. And all of a sudden, this nine-year-old, my nine-year-old son goes, Dad, that's gross. Let me tell you about a new life group that's starting in our church. It's a, a, a group of ladies have a heart for the women in that industry, and they're going to the gentlemen's clubs in Austin, and they're going back to the dressing rooms, and they're taking the women two things. One, they're taking them a rose to tell them that they matter to God, that God loves them, and that God sees them, and that they're valuable. And then they give them a Bible, and they show them how to read it and encourage them to read the word because there's another way. There's another way to live, and there's hope. But also in that Bible, there's a testimony of a woman who used to be in that industry, and now she's been set free. Now she has hope. Now she's going a whole different way in her life and that testimony relates to them and what they're dealing with and says, look, and this woman's testimony says, somebody saw me as a human being, told me that there was hope and saw me as a one among the many and now I'm living a different life and we'd love for you too as well. There's hope. We're here for you. Now let's just applaud that life group because that's awesome, okay? Now, that's an example of seeing one among the many and helping one among the many But let me just be very clear as your pastor, men cannot sign up for that group. (laughs) And here's why. Because now we're gonna move to the tension of the crowd because there's a tension, isn't there? As Christians, you gotta be careful where you go. You gotta be careful who you associate with. You gotta be careful what you listen to. And if you're not careful because the crowd will take you where you didn't wanna go. The crowd will take you in places in a direction that's against where God wants you to go. And so we need to pray for the people in the crowd. We need to love the people in the crowd, but we have to watch out because I'm gonna give you three ways the crowd is dangerous from our text today. Now, when I was thinking about the crowd, uh, I thought about many crowds I've been in, but uh, last year I I had the privilege to go and see the pastors. You guys support in Belarus and Romania. I even got to meet some of the church planters. You guys have started over three three to four churches in Ukraine uh, since the the, uh, crisis. Now, When we were in Bucharest, we had to get across the city to meet a church leader, and we forgot, it's like rush hour, okay? And uh, I I couldn't even get my phone out in the subway because it was so tight, I couldn't reach into my pockets. But when we got out, this is a picture of the crowd going up the stairs from that subway station. And let me just tell you, we needed to go right when we got to the top of the stairs, but most of this crowd went left. And it was so tense because the crowd was determining the pace, they were determining the place, and I could feel myself going left. I needed to go right. And I can tell you because the crowd, because it was just like movement, because it was like this mob of movement, I, I, there were several times I just thought to myself, you know what, I'm just gonna go left. I'll lose the group, <laughs> I won't get to my destination, I'll, I'll be lost, but at least I won't offend anybody. At least I won't, you know, like, because I'm like, oh, excuse me, seriously, excuse me, I, I, I'm going right, why are you going right? We're all going left, I'm going right. Why are you going, we're all going left, I'm I'm going right. The crowd is exhausting. It takes work to go against the crowd. And we're gonna see why Paul's life lesson is don't listen to them, you go God's way, and let's pick up the story. We gotta go, um, we gotta go God's way and not the world's way. So, Acts 14, let's pick up in verse 11. 
It says, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, in other words, wow, he just, it seemed like he healed him. Jesus healed him. His faith healed him. But watch this. They shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods in human form. And they, here it is, they decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes since he was the chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town. So the priests of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths and flowers to the town gates and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. Now I want you to circle the words they decided. Key words here. The crowd decided that Barnabas wasn't Barnabas. Barnabas was Zeus. The crowd decided that Paul wasn't a missionary. He was a messenger. He's a God. So write this down. The crowd will try to change your identity. It did then. It does now. It always has. The crowd always tries to convince you to do something that you know you shouldn't do. The crowd always tries to convince you to be something that you know you're not. The crowd always tries to convince you to believe something you know in your conscience isn't right and you know in reality isn't right. But the crowd is so convincing. They want you to believe. Did you catch this? You're a God. The crowd is like, you're Zeus. It's the same lie that was carried by the serpent in the book of Genesis. The crowd carries the lie of Satan himself. And basically says, the serpent said to Eve, you can be like God. And the crowd says the same thing. You don't need God. You are God. You're in control of yourself. You can, you can decide anything you want. Forget God. You're God. And they do this in the story. They do it with us. We have to be careful of the crowd because they say it to Barnabas. Barnabas, you're not the one who encourages people to follow God. Lay down that humility that causes you to affirm people. Take up pride. Be your own self-absorbed, self-centered person and declare what you are because whatever you declare, Bar Barnabas, will validate it. As a matter of fact, when you say it, we'll say it with you, and what we say is declared and real. The crowd's always done this. You're Zeus, you're Hermes, you're God. Now, where does the crowd exist today? This is very subtle, but you gotta watch out for this because the crowd is closer than you think. You carry the crowd around every day. And how much time do you spend listening to the crowd on social media? How much time do you spend listening to the crowd on a news feed? How much time do you spend listening to the crowd on Amazon Prime? Oh, you need this and I can get it to you tomorrow. You're God. You scroll through there. Now, this isn't very encouraging, but you know, with teenagers, that's ages 12 to 18, last year, they figured out how much time a teenager in America spent on social media. It's not very encouraging, but here it is, over 40 hours a week on average. This is their job, 40 hours a week. And I know you're like, Pastor, yeah, you tell them, those teenagers, they need to, listen, do I need to go back to the application point? Okay, so adults, we're not any better. I mean, the average adult is 17 hours a week. That means the adults last year, average adults you spent on social media, on your phone, you spent the equivalent of 36 days of your year listening to the crowd. So I wanna just, you know, I wanna encourage you like to just kind of think about this. The crowd is so subtle um, and what we're getting from the crowd is not healthy. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, one of our five kids is studying computer engineering and he's in a computer science class and he was telling me about this concept called GIGO. We know it as garbage in, garbage out. And basically, your output is determined by what you are putting in. And I just want to make the observation that as Christians in general, we are supposed to shine for Jesus brightly, but we are not shining as brightly as we could because we're consuming so much darkness. The crowd is lying to us, and we're going the way of the crowd, and we got to be careful. Okay, okay, I don't want to listen to the crowd. How do I keep from listening to the crowd? Well, Look at what Jesus does in Luke chapter five, verse 16. We're supposed to follow him, so let's follow Jesus. And it says, but Jesus would often, help me out five words online right here in the room. What are the five words? Go away from the crowd. He would go away from the crowd to pray in quiet places, all right? Now, online right here in the room, just tell your neighbor right now, just go away from the crowd. Just tell him, go away from the crowd, all right? Listen to your neighbor, go away from the crowd. Now, so, so here's the application, okay? This week, there's the assignment. I wanna ask you to 
be off of social media for one week. I'm gonna ask you not to look at your news feed on your phone for one week. I'm gonna ask you not to order anything on Amazon Prime for one week. I said that in the first service and a husband started fanning his wife at that moment, okay? And I know what you're saying, well, hey, no, hey, Pastor, I don't have a problem. I'm not addicted to it. Prove it. If you're not addicted, you can put it down. If you're addicted, put your phone down for one week. Put your phone down and don't listen to the crowd and look up and see the one and listen to the one who's got a word for you but speaks in a still small voice. He's always there. Get to quiet places. And even after you survive a week with no <laughs> social media or news feed, then just find those places and spaces in your day to do that. Um, I have a habit of doing this, not 100%, but fairly close, of just getting up in the morning before everybody else does and the noise of the day starts before the sunrise starts. And so this is a major city in Eastern Europe uh, as I was just moving around the city. But let me show you, this is a picture and there was nobody there. This bridge the night before, packed. Nobody there now. And if you really wanna get in on what God has for you, the path he has for you, you gotta move to a quiet space where the crowd is not screaming in your ear or subtly saying something, and just move to a place where you can get on the other side of what the crowd is saying and just say, you know what, I'm not Zeus. I'm not Hermes. I'm a child of God. And, and this is what Paul knows. He's like, no, 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 I, I know who I am. And he declares that, we'll see that. But write this down, the crowd will try to ignore God's generosity. Here's the second danger of the three. The crowd is so busy making themselves a God, they don't have time to thank the real one. And again, in verse 14, uh, Paul is so adamant. He knows who he is. He, he's not gonna let the crowd tell him his identity. He's like, look, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm saved by grace. I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He gave me a purpose. I know the tomb is empty. My heart isn't. I have a reason to be here. I have a mission in life. I have a purpose in life. And you're not gonna change that. I'm gonna go God's direction. Now look at verse 15, what he says. He says, we have come to bring you the good news. He points the crowd to the gospel. That's the word good news. And the good news is Jesus died on a cross, rose again, and he is the way to heaven. And you have to turn away from the world and turn to him. That's what he says here. Look, he says, turn from these worthless things. He's telling the crowd, hey, what you're pursuing is worthless. Turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without, help me out, six words, real life. What are the six words? Evidence of himself and his goodness. There is evidence of God's goodness everywhere in your life. The crowd will try to drown it out and ignore it. Look at verse 17. For instance, he says, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. You see, he's saying, hey, think about God as goodness. And friend, when's the last time you just thought about how good it is that God sent his only son to die on a cross for you, that anyone believes in him will not perish but have eternal life? When's the last time you just thought about that empty tomb that means you don't have to fear death itself? When's the last time you just thought about, he says, not just the gospel, the good news, but what is just about the goodness of God? When's the last time you just thank God for a sunrise or a sunset? What about that smile in your child's face and that sparkle in their eyes when they're creative? What about that friend that you know you can count on? What about the money that God brings to you so you can put food on the table. Thank him. Now listen, how do you know when the world's getting to you and you're listening to the world too much? When you stop thanking God. Gratitude is the first thing to go. I mean, have you ever had a food in front of you and, and you thought, maybe I should thank God for this, and you're like, nah, I bought it. I mean, nobody's here to hear it. Or maybe you thought the crowd would really get on to you because we're bowing our heads in a public place. Either way, thank God for the food. Get back to gratitude. It's so dangerous when you don't protect the attitude of gratitude. Let me show you, Paul wrote about it often. I'll show you an example. Romans chapter one, verse 21. Remember, this is Paul writing back to the church that he started in Rome. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him. 
It's a great description of our culture. You know there's somebody bigger than you out there, but you're not gonna acknowledge or worship him as God. Or even, three words, help me out real life, even what? Give him thanks. I'm not even gonna thank him. I'm too busy being God to thank him. I'm too busy being God to pause and really be grateful and reflect on gratitude. And they begin, watch this, when, when you stop being grateful, it is a cliff toward destruction. Look at this. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. The minute you stop thanking the real God, all of a sudden your view of God is messed up. How messed up? As a result, their minds became dark and confused. What a description of our culture today. Listen, how do you stay sane in a world that's going crazy? Very simple, here's the assignment. Stop every morning before you check on the crowd. Thank God. Thank God for his goodness. Think about the gospel. Think about his purpose for you. Think about his role, his design, his purpose for you, his mission for you, and get in on the direction of gratitude. That's how you wanna protect yourself from the crowd. And listen, you need to protect yourself from the crowd because, don't miss this, if you put your hope in the crowd, they will turn on you. They will crown you one minute and they will cancel you the next. They will elevate you, and then they will annihilate you. This is what happens to Paul. Look at this in the next verse. It says in verse 19, then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium. So they had just been to Iconium, so here comes, whenever you lift up the gospel, you're always gonna have enemies. And look at what they did. They won the crowds to their side, and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. How quick did that happen? Paul, you're God. We hate you, we're gonna kill you. 60 seconds. You go from hero to zero. If you latch yourself to the crowd, listen, if you latch yourself to the crowd, you're dead and you just don't know it. It's a dead end road to try to please everyone in the crowd. They'll steal your joy, they'll destroy your excitement, they'll destroy your conviction, and they leave Paul for dead, all right? Now, so write this word down, crowd. I'm gonna ask you today to move from the crowd don't say, listen, I'm gonna listen to the crowd. I'm just gonna stay with the crowd. I'm just gonna do what the crowd says. It's a dead end road. They'll never take you where God wants you to go, but also never take you what's best for you. They'll never take you. They'll take you on a road trip that's not reality. So, but there are people, even listen to me right now, and you say, you know what? I am who they say I am. I do what they say to do. If they tell me to do this, I do that. If they tell me to believe this, I believe that. And the crowd will turn on you. The crowd is a dead end road road. The crowd will rob you of energy and passion. Vitality is gone. So I'm going to ask you today to move from the crowd and just write this word down, move to community. Find a group of people. Listen, not perfect. This is what the church is. It's not a perfect place because it's got people in it, but it's serving a perfect uh, savior and find a group of people in community and decide to gather with them, but not just gather with them, galvanize your life to them. Find community. This is what Paul was building. He was building community to get away from the crowd and to listen to God so they could come back in the crowd and see the one among the many. You see, we all need community. We all need to, people around us who follow Christ instead of the crowd. So as practical as I can make it, um, I wanna invite you to Next Step. I know you've heard about it, but I think I've got a QR code on the screen. I wanna encourage you to take the step from the crowd and get into community. This is the quickest way to fast track your connection. It's a one-time seminar. It's not an eight-part class, but just one time. We do it the first of the month. It's from four to six in the afternoon. You can even do it online. But I wanna encourage you not to get to the summer and not be a part of next. If you're like, Pastor, I can't come the first Sunday of March. That's great. I've got it the first Sunday of April. So I can't make it the first Sunday of April. That's fine. I've got it the first Sunday of May. But I want you to get online right now and sign up and say, you know what? I'm not gonna go through another year swayed by the crowd. The Christian life's not a Lone Ranger uh, event or a sport that's a uh, solo sport. It's a team sport. And I'm gonna connect myself. And now this is why. You need to fast track yourself to a gathering of community. This family is gonna help you grow. This family is gonna gather around you because the world, the culture, the crowd is always gonna be after you, always gonna be throwing rocks from a distance at you. You need a place to gather. Now look at what happens to Paul. He had a community. Look at verse 20. And I love this, just circle this. But listen, the crowd will try to kill you. The crowd will try to destroy your joy, your purpose, your excitement, your passion for God, but as the believers gathered 
around him. Do you have those people? The believers gathered around him. He had community. Now, where do they come from? He's only been in this town a few days. How in the world did he already have a church? That's what Paul did. He started churches. The church is not a building. The church is people. And he had people. Now, who are they? It doesn't tell us, but you know who they are? Barnabas. Barnabas came into town with him, had a mission. Paul says, listen, man, I'm not Hermes. And Paul, Barnabas says, I'm not Zeus. We're here for Jesus. You know who else was in this crowd? The guy whose feet were healed. Because now he can walk. He's been changed by the gospel and the hope. And he says, hey, Paul, look, my feet work. And I'm gonna drag you back into town. <laughs> you, you can't move. Now, some scholars believe this is when Paul literally did die for a moment and had that glimpse of heaven he writes about later. But either way, he was helpless. He couldn't move. He needed community. We all do. But because he had community, did you catch it? The believers gathered around him and watch this, circle these three words. He got up. This world will beat you up, throw things at you, try to kill your joy. You need a place to come every weekend and gather and say, man, that was a rough week. Man, the crowd said this, the crowd did this, the lies were flying. Like, hey, the believers gather around you. He got up and where did he go? Back into town. Hey, every Sunday, you need, hey, you're going back to work. You're going back home. You're going back to your neighborhood. It's gonna be okay. We got you. We care about you. We're all gonna do this together. We're all going to fulfill the mission together. None of us are gonna listen to the crowd. And the next day he left with Barnabas, last stop before Antioch, Derby. He said, I'm still on the mission. I'm still going where God has me to go. Now, as you listen to this and look at this, I hope it's obvious to you that the crowd is always trying to get you to listen to them and then they will turn on you and destroy you. It's always been that way, so don't, don't give into that. And there's things, did you, do you know that what social media is, by the way, is just an algorithm of affirmation to affirm how you're feeling that day. So listen, if you feel like Zeus, Zeus will appear. All Zeus lovers, there is a gathering in Austin. What? You can order a Zeus t-shirt today and get one free, no way. Zeus, 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 whatever you're feeling, it will affirm you, it'll declare it. The crowd will say yes, but you need somebody like Barnabas going, hey man, you're not a God, neither am I. We're not gonna listen to the crowd. We're gonna listen to the Lord. And I'm telling you, you can scroll through this all you want to, but social, secular psychologists will tell you more than 10 minutes of social media, you'll be more depressed, have less energy, and have less passion and vitality. The crowd will kill it. Christ will bring it to life. He'll, so we're gonna go from the crowd to community, right? This, we wanna change, okay? The crowd is gonna confuse you, shout you down, try to knock you down, and maybe sometimes succeed. You need someone who will help you up. And here's how it all works. Paul writes this in Romans 12 too. He says, don't change yourselves. Notice he's talking, some, some whole churches go the way of the world. Whole churches go in the way of the crowd. But he says, no, no, listen, don't change yourselves. You need each other. Don't change yourselves to be like the people of this world. I think he was thinking about Lister when he wrote this. This crowd yelling at him, you're a God, you're a God, you're a God. We sacrifice you, you're amazing. He said, don't be like, but, and say these four words when we real life. What are the four words? Let God change you. I'm gonna ask today, you let God change you. Make that decision, I'm gonna let God change me. Inside with a new way of, watch this, thinking. I'm not gonna think this way, I'm gonna think this way. Then you'll be able to understand and, last six words, say it with me, accept what God wants for you. Today, friend, would you accept what God wants for you? It's a good, pleasing, and perfect plan with a purpose and with a passion that has eternal meaning. So let's pray about that together. With your head bowed and eyes closed, I want you to know, friend, with your head bowed and eyes closed, if you're online or right here in the room, I want you to know that just like Paul saw this man who was hurting, I assure you that God sees you today. He sees you. Jesus sees you. He knows your name. He knows your need. And right now, he, listen, he wants to change you, but you just have to humbly ask him to. So I'm gonna ask you right now just to whisper a prayer, not out loud, just in your heart, just... Just tell him, God, I wanna change. And just tell him, forgive me for going my own way. Forgive me for going with the crowd. Right now, I turn from this world, I turn to you. 
thank you for dying on the cross for me. Just tell him, forgive me. And just ask him right now, as best I know how, Lord, I open my heart to you. Come into my life and change me from the inside out. Give me a new way of thinking and a new direction. If you just whispered that prayer, friend, he heard you, and you're not leaving this service alone. He's in your heart and your life. And I just wanna pray for all of us right now, whether you just made that decision or in days gone by. Lord, I love you. Thank you for the power of your word. I know you've spoken today. I ask God that before we leave this place, as we are gonna sing a closing song about Jesus, you're the king of kings. All of us were in darkness. And Father, I pray that you would move people who are in the crowd, the community, gather them with a church family. Lord, help them to see that serving and being in a life group and being a part of a church and finding a friend within the family of faith is so important. Lord, I also ask God that you would help us as a church to shine for you brightly, that we would see, God, that our job is not to shout back to the crowd, Our job is to pick them off one at a time. To see the one among the many who is drawn to the light and the love of Jesus. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us push back darkness with the gospel. And Father, that our feet will be prepared with peace this day. That you would bless every heart and every home. And that we would interact more with you and with each other than with the crowd this week. And I ask it in the name of the one who had mercy on the crowd and his heart broke for the crowd our Lord and Savior and Shepherd, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Let's give God a hand for his love. It's true.